I'm Mike Dooley, and for the past 12 years at least, I have been a full-time teacher on the nature of reality. I first got started in all of this, gosh, perhaps as a, as a kid, without knowing it, I was always driven by this desire to know how, why, what's the point? Uh, and of course, in Sunday school class, as many of us did, drove the priests and the nuns to distraction with questions that they couldn't or wouldn't answer. And uh, that never went away. And at the point uh, that I was around 18, 19, the yearning I had for answers uh, was almost overwhelming. I would go to Bible studies at the University of Florida. I would go to different kind of meetup groups, uh, just looking for answers. And I was obsessed. My entry point philosophically was uh, the idea of death. And, and it was like, you know, everyone dies and everyone's gone forever. Uh, and we're here for how long? So short compared to forever? Uh, What's the point and where do we go? And to me, death highlighted life. Uh, and so uh, not finding anything close to an answer that made any logical sense to me, uh, I kind of went on a path where I was drawing my own conclusions that, you know, that we all must be the eyes and the ears of the divine, of God. Hate to use that word because it's so loaded with baggage, it means different things to different people. But, you know, uh, still I recognize, and I think anyone who faintly attempts to recognize that there has to be intelligence in this universe. It's so awesome, so spectacular. Um, the, the, there's a reason. And uh, so with that as my given, I started to draw conclusions that, that we must all be of that intelligence. We couldn't not be part of it. How, how, what would we be made of if not of God? And uh, I surmised even earlier than that that you know, time must be uh, non-existent non at a greater level. Uh, and therefore, so must space be non-existent. They must be illusions. And uh, about my sophomore year, my mother, who's an avid reader, and, and I don't like to read, called me. She lived two hours away and said, you know, I, I've read this book. Oh my gosh, you won't believe it. It's unbelievable. Oh my gosh, it's so profound. And she went on to say that this was a book that was dictated, it was channeled by a woman at the time living named Jane Roberts, who's of course not living today. But Jane Roberts dictated a series of books. I think there was 15 to 20 of them, and there's still new ones coming out because there are people who have access to the library. Uh, dictated the Seth material. Seth is this disincarnate being who used to live in time and space. Now he's in other realms or dimensions. He, he would say, I'm not Seth. I, I, that's just a small particle. I'm not male or female. Those are just things that you do in time and space. But uh, as she started to describe this to my, you know, 19, 20 year old mind from a very, um, you know, traditional background, I was really concerned. I thought, you've lost it, mom. <laughs> this is not sane talk. Uh, and she immediately shut me down with, Mike, forget the source of this material. Just listen or read what Seth has to say about reality. And when she speaks like that, and I've always been extremely close to her to this day, I listen, I pay attention. And within a week, the book showed up in the mail. And this was pre-internet, pre-everything. And um, I read the Seth material. And Seth not only confirmed this litany, uh, this list of my own conclusions about life, our power, which has to come from our thoughts. That's the only thing that differentiates one person from another, truly, deeply speaking. Um, not only did Seth confirm all of my own intuitive feelings about life, feelings that are not that unique, feelings that I think many people naturally have, but, but at least I had the wherewithal to formulate them and to kind of buy into them. Like, this must be the case until you can show me otherwise. 
but Seth went beyond and started connecting dots that I could never have even dreamed existed, but of a very benign, benevolent nature. And, and if I could say this about the Seth material, I certainly say this about all that I now teach, because most of what I teach still comes from gut intuition or some inner sense of intelligence. Um, the Seth material, like what I teach, reveals life's beauty. It speaks of our power. And it leaves no one behind. To me, that's kind of my litmus test for truth. You know, if it's exclusionary, as are virtually all religions by their very definitions, if it's like, you know, we who believe this go here, and those who don't, well, you know, good luck. Uh, you know, no, truth doesn't leave anybody behind. You know, we are all the eyes and the ears of the divine. And, and so then I was electrified by this stuff. And so then I was applying it to the best of my ability to my life as a college student and then as a practicing certified public accountant. Um, but always mulling this stuff over. And then finally, six years into the corporate world with PricewaterhouseCoopers, I went out on my own as an entrepreneur where I ended up sharing and teaching these ideas as little poems on t-shirts that my brother designed. Uh, that business roared for 10 years, at which point the trends were declining, we liquidated, and we went our own way, which brought about the most terrifying time of my entire life. I was almost 40 years old, today I'm 53, and I had no idea what would come next. And I had a small amount of money to coast for a couple of years, but a mortgage that was way bigger than my life savings. And I was like, now what do I do? And that's when I started directly using the internet, which was brand new back then to most of us, to espouse and share the philosophies that have been rumbling around in my head f since my teenage years. Um, and uh, I'm a, a published author. I have eight books, two New York Times bestsellers. I speak perpetually on tour around the world. I go home and I'm home more than I'm on the road, but nevertheless, the tour picks up three weeks later and I visit two more cities and I go home. I have uh, audio programs, DVDs, participated in The Secret, and um, I'm living the absolute life of my dreams, incorporating these things in my own uh, trials, tribulations, dreams, and, and the challenges I face. I'm always the student, always um, applying this stuff, but uh, as a living, I share as I go. And nothing could possibly thrill me more than what I now do, living what I teach. And so hence, I'm a teacher, and that's how I got started doing this. Well, as you probably know, I write a daily note from the universe and have been doing so well over 10 years. And before that, I was writing as Mike. Uh, same stuff, but much more popular when you write as the universe. Basically, I send out a little email to people uh, as if I was the universe, and I remind them of life's beauty and their power. And uh, it's something that I wanted to receive myself back when I started sending them out. When I was at a really low time in my life, feeling like I was completely starting over, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool, in addition to these positive quotes that I have plastered around my house and on my refrigerator, if I got an email every day that from the universe or, or from anybody uh, with some information that would inspire me and remind me that we live in a world of illusions, that our thoughts become things, that all things are possible. Go, Mike, go. And so that was the genesis of my daily emails that evolved quickly into notes from the universe. And the process I have for writing them is uh, loose, and uh, I do my best to follow it, but it's modeled on what I teach. It's modeled on how to bring about any manifestation in our lives. Think of what you want in terms of the end result. Do not worry about how. Do not think about the minutia. Don't micromanage it. Just in your mind's eye, go to a place where it already exists. And so for a note from the universe, that place is, woohoo! I wrote an awesome note, and I know what it feels like to have written what I think is an awesome note. And so, so for usually, I set a timer for one minute 
just one minute. And during that one minute, I'm just like, yes, I love my life. I love this job. That was so easy. This is so fun. There's so many notes. There's an infinite number, as many grains of sand on the earth. That's how many notes, awesome notes, wait to be written. And so I'm in this place of, I've done it. I've done it. Without thinking what I'll write about, whether it's gratitude or appreciation or judgment or dreams coming true, those are all hows. That's minutia. That's not what our brain's for. Our brain is this phenomenal instrument, if you will, that, that taps our spiritual energy and that brings it forth. And we dictate what is brought forth with images in our mind of the end result, or even better than images, feelings, emotion. This is what it's all about. So that woo-woo joy that I feel when I visualize for one minute before I write summons good ideas so that there will then be a manifestation that's, that replicates, that makes real, that actualizes that joy. This is how emotions become things. We literally manipulate, if you will, kind of a fun word sometimes, the world around us, including people who are in alignment with us, who have complementary end results. We draw them into our sphere and we meet them serendipitously, like, oh my gosh, I sat next to so-and-so on the airplane and they told me about this and I went to the website and my life's changed. Or, or a new best friend or business partner, clients, customers, whatever you're you're looking for, the end result summons it and creates the circumstances that seem to be so coincidental or random. This is why there is no such thing as a coincidence. This is how there is no such thing as a coincidence or an accident, happy, sad, or otherwise. Everything that happens to us is a function of our inner vibration that's sparked by our inner thoughts in our mind or moreover the emotions that we pump through this vessel that brings about circumstances that will yield a manifestation, an actualization of what we were thinking about. So step two, however, is all important. After I hold that image in my mind and feel that emotion running through my being, step two Whatever it is you want, act on it. Take action, which usually means act even though you don't know what it is that's going to bring it about, you know, when it comes to a dream coming true. You know, it, these are the baby steps that always seem futile. The baby step for me as a writer of Notes from the Universe, after I have created the end result in my mind, is I start typing. What do I type? I don't know. Type anything. And I will literally type, you know, the dog sat on the barrel. You know, uh, no, it, not a dog this time, uh, the tree. Now, the reason the tree, uh, the trees have reason. And it spins into something totally unlike the dog sat on the barrel. But this is, again, metaphoric of how all things come to pass. Have the dream, the champagne and caviar, the soulmate, the, the vacation, the career that thrills you, the improved health, and then do something about it. But now that you've just dreamed of these glorious dreams and you're faced with here and now, do something about it. It's like, what? Go to that job I hate at the mall? Yes, go to that job you hate at the mall. But for having programmed the magic with these new end results, you're going to be alert on the way. You're going to hear something on the radio. You're going to see something out of your car, a, a billboard. Uh, and all of a sudden, the pieces start assembling seamlessly. You think it's just ordinary life. We think that the physical world is concrete reality. It's not. It's a hologram that we create, that we project, but we do so seamlessly so as not to kind of break the authenticity of it so that we can therefore believe that it's real and therefore be driven by our passions, fall in love, be fallen in love with, and hence we have a lifetime. <clears throat> Point being, after the lofty dreams, you still need to show up and do something with baby steps. And don't be discouraged that they seem paltry, that they don't seem connected to this wild life you've just been dreaming. Take them anyway. And then prepare to be astounded. It won't be the third step. Chances are it won't be the 300th step. It'll be the 3,000th step when you have a big dream you want to come true. But rest assured, it's going to come true because you live in a dream world. And for me, when I write, you know, the little notes from the universe are usually only a paragraph long. They will still to this day sometimes take hours to hammer out. And I'll daydream and I'll get mad and I'll start over and I'll delete and then I'll add on and then I'll be, uh, then I'll take a phone call and then I'll <laughs> Google something. But this is the process. I used to beat myself up for daydreaming or taking a long time or not being more focused. But 
I've learned to kind of chill out. Rome wasn't built in a day. And uh, whatever it is you want, it's coming to you. And the more you can be at peace with that knowingness, the easier it is to bide your time. And the more you realize that everyone needs some diversity and some diversions in their life, the more gentle you can be in letting the process unfold. And so that's how I write a note from the universe. I hold the end result in my mind and emotionally for about a minute with a timer. And then I just take action on it and I start writing whatever comes to mind and I massage it and I tweak it and I change it and I give it a rest and I daydream and I go back to it. And it's the same. This is my main teaching in life, you know, that we are deliberate creators, that our thoughts become things. If there's something you don't like, you can do something about that. You can transform it. You can transform yourself. You can transform your life. So hold the vision in your mind. Use vision boards. Use scrapbooks. Listen to enriching audio programs. Read empowering books. Whatever it is for you. Listen to Kanye West or whatever it is for you. And, and then do what you can with what you've got from where you are. And the pieces of the puzzle will assemble themselves as long as you keep at it. And of course, you'll be drawn through uncharted territory. That's what a dream implies. That's why you're dreaming it, because you've never been there before. And it's natural then that you don't know how you're going to get there, nor what you'll be drawn through to get there, nor how much higher you will have to raise the bar on your own self to get there. You know, you might have to, to, to deal with leaving your comfort zone. You might have to take up public speaking like I did. You might have to inject yourself into conversations or make some cold calls or reach out to the unknown or unknown people and players and face rejection and declines and the the big no but this is going to this is what it's really all about you have a dream that calls you to a higher place which forces you to face fears you didn't even know you had until you went out to climb that mountain. But then you conquer those fears and you become more than who you were before the, the dream presented itself. You ultimately get the dream, but so much more. Dreams are always far better made real, made manifest than you dreamed that they would be because getting there, you became more than you were when you started. And then when you're there, it ain't no thing. And you see further on the horizon and you want more and you want to tweak it and you want to polish it and you want a second one and you want a third one. And the adventure goes and you grow and you can, it never ends. God, if you will, is in a perpetual state of growth, meaning God, if you will, like you and I and everyone else, uh, wants things that have not yet come to pass. I used to think, you know, you know, we're all creatures of change. We all want to change everything about ourselves. Does that mean we're never satisfied? Is that a sorry reflection on humanity? It's like, no, this is the trait of the immortal. This is God come alive in flesh. This is us constantly growing, meaning, oh, oh now I see further on the horizon. I want that, which means today I don't have it. Celebrate that you don't have it, that you don't have it, but now want it means you're going to get it. This is the journey too often today in this society where people want change so quickly. You know, they want instantaneous gratification. You know, they name on their hands and toes and fingers all the things they want, and then they take stock and not have any of it. Well, they think, oh man, something's so wrong with me. Look at so-and-so, and look at so-and-so, and look at these people. They all have it. So many people have what I want, but I don't have it. Must be something wrong with you. Like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. Everything's right about you, including, perhaps especially, this desire to kind of expand and to, to be more complete and more fulfilled. But, but you're never going to be completely fulfilled. And this is our greatest gift. It means that there'll always be another reason to get out of bed because there'll always be another height to attain. And this is not to be confused with a, a me, me, me message. You know, I'm going to make everything happen. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the, the individual's pursuit of happiness. I think there's everything right. It, I think we have strong societies when the individuals honor their preferences. But I, I know that the critic hearing some of my work can say, you know, this is a selfish man or a selfish ideology about more, 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 about glitz, 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 about champagne and caviar, getting the new car, the new boat, the new whatever it is that, that somebody might want. It's like when one succeeds, we all succeed. And we don't all want uh, the new car or the new boat. You know, it, you grow out of that phase in your 20s. and and 
there's something more important you realize is on the horizon or immediately in front of you, and that is uh, fitting into society, not conforming, but being useful. Uh, I used to run away at the word service, you know, being of service. Like, oh, you know, to me that meant selflessness. And I deplore any sense or approach to life from a selfless perspective. I celebrate the selfish pursuit of our interests because that adds to everyone. You know, Bill Gates, thank God that guy did what he did and followed his selfish heart because my life is way better because of him. And thank God Mother Teresa didn't go to Silicon Valley because we probably would still be using abacuses and ten keys. Um, thank God Mother Teresa followed her bliss. She did what she wanted to. She was a divinely selfish soul. And when we all tune in to what we most want, then we can all shine a light in a corner of reality or on this planet where no one else is going to end up shining a light, completing this mosaic, this tapestry of creativity and infinite possibilities that will make the human race, the civilization that we're now part of, shine like we can't even dream of it one day shining at this primitive juncture. Probably the one thing that I'm most passionate about, that, that thrills me, that I most want to convey to people. Not so much because they need to hear it, although those who do find it and resonate with it, and I, I think I can say it thrills them, but because it just thrills me in my own pursuit of happiness, and that is that we are creators, and we create through the focus and the power of our thoughts. Our thoughts literally become the things and events of our lives. They have an energy and a life force of their own that literally, or perhaps metaphorically, rearrange the players and the props of the stage of our lives, predisposing us to those so-called accidents, coincidences, and serendipities that will yield a physical world identical to what we have been thinking. Now, I, I like to point out that there is more to life than being a deliberate creator. I mean, there's there's relationships, there's patience, there's the lessons that we all learn. And there's people who speak on all of those because it thrills them. But for me, it's the fact that we are creators and that we create through our chosen focus, our, our energy, our words, uh, our imagination. My home base as a teacher is my website, tut.com, T-U-T.com. It used to stand for Totally Unique T-shirts and today we're kind of uh, still using it because it's so short and memorable. But there I send out my free daily notes from the universe. There I announce uh, my new books, audio programs, tour events, uh, and uh, adventures to uh, exotic places twice a year that I take folks. TUT.com.